Hey, at the end of today's episode, I really want you to stick around because I have a real special announcement. Now, I hope you enjoy today's show. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. A special thanks goes out to our sponsor, Wonder Capital, an online investment platform that allows individuals to invest in solar projects across the United States. Learn how you can begin earning up to 11% returns at wondercapital.com slash James. That's W-U-N-D-E-R Capital. Wonder Capital, do well and do good. Today's show is brought to you by FreshBooks, an extremely fast and user-friendly cloud accounting software made by a small business owner for small businesses, entrepreneurs, and anyone who wants to get paid fast. Join over 5 million FreshBooks users who effortlessly create and send invoices in seconds. Just go to freshbooks.com slash James and enter James in the how did you hear about us section. Today on the James Altucher Show. The Ten Commandments of the Con Artist, going back to your question on what we can learn. And one of them was a con artist isn't a great talker. A con artist is a great listener. Um, And that's, I mean... It's a con artist commandment, but that's actually a really wonderful insight into human relationships. This is why I think when I'm reading the book, I felt like, oh my gosh, am I a victim or am I a con artist? (laughs) A lot of these techniques, they're also used in very positive situations. Absolutely. Like you don't mention in the book, but this exact technique is used by Benjamin Franklin. There's so many stories yeah. of cons in the book, by the way. It's like an encyclopedia <laughs> of con artistry. Let me send you the hundreds of pages that didn't make it in. All know? right. So I've got the smartest person that I've ever had on this podcast in this room, Maria Konnikova, author of The Confidence Game, Why We Fall For It Every Time, and also uh, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. I might be getting the t- actual title of that wrong. Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. Maria, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, James. And Maria, you, um, I kind of, I want to get into the books and particularly the confidence game because I feel, when I was reading the book, two things happened to me. One is I realized I probably have been conned almost every single day all of my <laughs> life. Like there's so many cons I've fallen for, like both big and small. Yeah. And, but then the other thing I felt when I was reading the book is I kept thinking to myself, Oh no, am I a con man? Like I got like really paranoid reading it, but we'll get to that. Um, I want to go into your background first. You're from Russia? Yeah. Initially? I was born in Moscow. Moscow? When did you move to um, uh, the United States? Still the Soviet Union, 1988. So before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then, uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, it it seems like you're obsessed with this kind of out of the box observation and thinking, which occurs both in the, you know, the show, when you show people how to think like Sherlock Holmes, obviously he's a great capital Mm -hmm. O observer. And in terms of trying to analyze confidence games, con artists, swindlers, and so on, both from the point of view of the current artist and from from the point of view of the victim, a lot of it is about how we can observe what is happening around us, how we can be mindful without just slipping into these traps. Do you think that comes from a little bit, this interest from your background growing up a little bit in the Soviet Union where in some sense the system itself was conning uh, the population? Absolutely. I mean, you should hear some of the discussions around my dinner table when I was growing up. Um, like what were, know, what were so, the topic? So my parents weren't dissidents, but they were people who really disagreed with the Soviet Union. And so I grew up with this awareness of just how fragile kind of the things that we take for granted here really are and how, you know, how easy it is to get into a world where people can't even trust members of their own family, where you can't talk about anything. I remember when I was very little when we left, but I remember being told that I wasn't allowed to tell anyone that we were leaving because they could refuse um, our request to leave. Were your parents we scared? Were, yeah. They were, so they didn't want me to talk about it. And I remember getting directives, you know, you can't talk about it. I didn't know any better. So at some point, I think I blurted out, we're going to America. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. That was, that was, uh. Did your parents hit you after that? No, my parents never hit me. (laughs) But, um, you know, it is such a different world, even today. I mean, I think we're going back to Soviet times in some ways with Putin. Really? Um, Yeah, he's scary. I mean, he's KGB. He's and and now now a lot of people though are also in, in America. You must notice people are also critical of America, and yeah. nothing wrong with that. It's freedom of speech sure. in America. Uh, you're, you're allowed to leave this country, for instance, but there's still room for for criticism. Do you think that in some sense there's equivalent? 
propaganda in the United States against its people, or is totally different? I think it's totally different. I think we feel that it's the same because we've never known anything else. But I think that we don't understand what a truly closed society is like. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a qualitative difference, not a quantitative difference. Um, and so people here are free to criticize. I mean, no one's being thrown in jail. Um, nobody is being, you know, shut up. No newspapers are being closed down, at least for now. I mean, every um, now and then there's an attempt, like you could think of uh, Watergate and the Washington sure, Post. Sure, but we know about it. That's the right. thing. And other newspapers cover it, and then people are held responsible. Um, in the Soviet Union and in Russia today, I don't think people... You, you don't have that freedom. You don't know about it. And people are just shut up and thrown in jail for spurious causes, or not thrown in jail, but they'll never really say their true opinion. And I think that's very scary. It's a society that's really um, muted from the top. And, and again, do you think this um, kind of, am I, am I making too much of a leap by saying this triggered your interest in ways in which we're affected by not only societal propaganda, but almost human propaganda. You know, the way con artists swindle mm -hmm. their victims is almost like creating this human propaganda machine. Absolutely. No, I do think it influenced it. I think the other influence was the fact that I didn't speak any English when I came. And so I was always very you know, conscious of language and of the power of language and what language can do and how the ability to communicate can really open up so much for you. I mean... You know, language is power and words are power. Not having it, I remember feeling so incredibly powerless. I couldn't do anything. And so that was something that really, I think, was a, always a driving force for me and made me incredibly you know, open to those minor influences. And if you think about con artists, I mean, their greatest gift and tool is language, storytelling, you know, how they use words to kind of weave a tale for us and to really draw us in. It's funny because storytelling, people forget this is the main way for tens of thousands of years or millions of years even that information was transferred from generation to generation. It wasn't just, yeah. you know, don't go over there in the woods. It was like the last time someone went over there, uh, demons came out and chewed them yes. up and danger happened. So it was always like a story to incite emotions, mm -hmm. you know, so that it was enough to A, educate and B, transfer down even to further generations. It's the way our species survived is through yeah. storytelling. And so it's funny how these things that were so positive, I mean, we, we wouldn't be storytellers unless there was a positive evolutionary reason for it. And yet these are the exact things that allow people to be both victims and con artists. Like we hear a story, we believe it, we tell a story, we manipulate it and so on. I think that's absolutely right. And story, I mean, storytelling is a very basic, I think, human instinct, human need. It's a very basic part of our humanity. And it is incredibly evolutionarily beneficial. I mean, there's a reason that stories have evolved, have survived. I mean, you can imagine people around, um, you know, campfires before language was really inventing acting out stories. You know, if you actually look at some of the data on communication, it ends up that our nonverbal cues are much stronger than our verbal cues, that we can actually get a lot of context and a lot of story without any words whatsoever. So I, I think it predates so much um, so much else that has happened in human cognition and human evolution. Well, well, it's interesting because then it gets, I want to get into some of the specifics of a lot of the cons that you bring up in the, in the book, The Confidence Game, but it, it, it does sort of blur the line between what's, you know, a con and what's honesty and truthfulness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, of course, con artists take advantage of is yeah. that line is blurred. It's no one, it's very hard to point a finger even to this day and say, okay, that's a con and this is truthful because marketing, of course, is sure. all and sales is all in that yeah. gray area. But, but, and religion, of course, is in that gray area. And you point out the quote from Voltaire, although you mentioned it could have been from many other sources, you know, uh, um, religion started when the first fool met the first scoundrel. So, and that's kind of the case with all cons. Yeah. So, so. Give us an example of like a con. You have a couple of favorites in the book. I mean, there's so many, by the way, con artists and swindles that you mention in the book. It, it, it begs the question, which maybe we can address later, how many uncaught cons and swindles are happening right now in the world? Because obviously yeah. the ones who are caught are the ones you write in the right. book, but the, the million that haven't been caught That's are still out there. Absolutely right. I mean, the number is astronomical. We have no good statistics about the prevalence of con artists because the vast majority is never caught. I mean, and I mean, just in the, so past, in the past day, you're just looking at email, you yeah. see 
I just, you know, I did the exercise after reading the book, mm -hmm. just how many possible cons were in my email. Yeah. And it was amazing. And that, and, and I'm just talking about the, my friends and family. I got and there's all the yesterday. email phishing and spamming and all that yeah. that, that, that get you. But okay, so what are some of your favorite cons in the in the book? Well, I think my absolute favorite is the one that I open with, Ferdinand Waldo de Mara, the great imposter, because he operated for decades. So we think of, you know, we think of Frank Abagnale and Catch Me If You Can. That guy was caught after two years. You know, he wasn't... Really? Only, he only, he, he was only he acted only, for two he, years? Maybe it was three, but it was just in his teens. It was just a few years. And he did a lot in those years, but he was caught. And Damara kept getting caught and kept doing it through the 80s. I mean, the guy was operational during my lifetime. Okay, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into the specifics on that one. Yeah. So he, he, what he was really good at was taking on a new identity yes. a new job like he was a he was a doctor in in a war situation yeah. he was a, a texas prison warden he was you know running a religious monastery or or various yeah. religious yeah. things um what and this is going to sound like an odd question but what did he do that was bad well, he was, I mean, he pretended to be a surgeon. He had but never he finished. successfully. We don't know that. Okay. So here's the thing. So we have his account um, and we know that nobody died aboard the ship. But as I point out, everyone left. So all of the people on, on whom he operated left the ship right after the surgery. We And he had plied them with so many antibiotics and so much stuff to actually prevent anything bad from happening right there. So who knows, 24 hours later, maybe some of them did die. But he was the only one know. willing to operate on them. He was the only surgeon around. Like they would have exactly. definitely died if he wasn't there. This is true, this is true. Um, but you know, would they have if they had medical supplies and someone was willing to clean their wounds, someone who didn't actually cut them open and to send them to a ship that did have doctors. I mean, there were other ships in, in, I see. in North Korea. So the Korea. fact that he was claiming to be a doctor kind of maybe Everybody said, "Oh, send these this, these guys to, to him, this guy with the, the doctor." Surgeon. So that might have been the bad thing yes. that happened there. So I, I mean, I think it's very, and he got very lucky, obviously. But I think it's very scary to think that somebody without a high school education, who's never performed any form of surgery whatsoever, is going to cut you open. And think about his, I mean, his narcissism, kind of the playing God type of thing to say, "Oh, I can do that," you know, I guess no in, problem. I guess in all of the kind of fraud situations that he was in, it was this kind of almost psychological playing God dynamic he yes. was playing out. Like being a prison warden means you're in charge of thousands of prisoners. Yep. Uh, being a head of a monastery, of course, yep. is playing out some kind of religious theme. Yeah, so, bodies, souls, <laughs> yeah, everything. And so, so even though he wasn't necessarily swindling people out of money, although no. we don't really know, he was kind of playing out some some emotional need in himself. Yes. And I, I don't know, you've certainly seen a, a picture of him. It wasn't in your book, but I've looked up a picture. Yeah. He's a huge, massive guy. He is guy. huge. He is not someone who looks particularly trustworthy. And he has these tiny eyes in a huge face. Yeah, this and huge, he, like, yeah. triangular face. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yet people trusted him, loved him. His biographer, Robert Crichton, kept believing in him, even though he kept conning him. Now, he conned Crichton out of a lot of money. Crichton kept giving him money cash every single day. He bought him a car. He paid for his education so that he wow. could actually be a religious leader. And every single time, Damara would let him down and become a con artist again because he he loved it. I think he loved that power over other people. So so in what sense was Damara a skilled con man? So if I were to kind of go out there and say, oh, hey, I'm a doctor, I'll do surgery, people are just going to believe me. I don't necessarily have to do any kind of a particular persuasion mm -hmm. and if i read the bible i can go and say oh i could be the head of i'm, mm -hmm. I'm a trained priest or monk mm -hmm. or whatever so what what were the skills he was using or was he just like a pathological liar no he was definitely incredibly skillful he could persuade people of just about anything even when they had evidence to the contrary he like was how? he was very good at you know at basically reading other people so that he could then use that to reflect their best self on them so let me give you the example of Crichton he said you know i chose you because you're the best writer um, and I know that you're the right person to tell my story. I chose you. And so Crichton right away wants to show him in a positive light. Crichton actually went through two drafts of The Great Impostor. And the first one was not very positive. And then he threw it out because he decided that it was wrong, that Damar was really a good guy. Mm. Um, and so it's one of those things where you 
it's not just flattery. It's also true empathy in some sense because, you know, Damara listens. He knows that Crichton's, you know, wife is pregnant and that she, he's very nervous and he's worried about her. So he talks about that a lot. You know, he, he actually employs skills that we'd be well-placed to employ in our day-to-day um, interactions like because they're, well, it's good to listen, right? And it's good to actually empathize with people and to hear what they're saying and to talk about them rather than talking about you. Uh, most people don't like to do that. Most people like to talk about themselves and most people don't actually listen when they ask a question. And you kind of refer to this with also another con. Um, and I remember this woman very clearly or not, not the woman herself, but her location always in the West Village, uh, Sylvia Mitchell, the yes, psychic. Yes. I always kept passing there for a decade thinking, boy, I just want to go in there just to see. Yeah. And I would like look in the window and, you know, I just wanted to see, but I never, I never did it. But you mentioned in the story of her, and we could describe her story in a second, how important reading other people yes. uh, became for her, for her con. Maybe describe that particular yeah, con. Yeah, I mean, so, so she was able to convince, I mean, probably thousands of people over her career, but she's now in prison for two, two particular ones. Is that place shut of, down? Is that location shut no, down? No, it's still there. Who's, um, who's but, the psychic? Um, I'm not sure, but she has a large family. Uh. So Mitchell is actually a very common psychic name. They're all, it's an assumed name that a lot of Roma took when they came to the United States. Why? Um, to be more American, to kind uh, of so there are lots of Mitchells who are psychics. Why are why so, Mitchell not Johnson or Smith? Or, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. I wish I knew. But so it's still operational. But now it's been rebranded a little, just as Z, not Zania. Uh, so so I'm not sure if the lawsuit has anything to do with it. But the the women that she ended up swindling in, for this particular lawsuit were really smart. I mean, one of them worked in Goldman Sachs. Um, one yeah. of them ran kind of this ballroom dance publicity company. So really kind of educated, intelligent women. Um, and she was able to convince them to give her tens, and in one case, hundreds of thousands of dollars to reverse curses in past life and do all of this stuff that looking at it from the outside, you think, how in the world is this possible? Yeah, I'm like sorry. I can't, ima <laughs> I can't imagine walking into a situation like that and ha like she would say, um, "You have this too much attachment to mm -hmm. money. Um, let me hold this twenty eight thousand yes. dollars in a jar, and I'll give it back to you whenever yeah. you ask." And then, of course, she never gave it back. And I can't imagine handing someone twenty eight thousand dollars to hold in a jar for me. Yeah. Like, but but yet, yeah, like you said, these were very intelligent people, and you and you often point out that it's the smartest people that are easily. Kind. Right. So, so how does it? How, do these people come in with the belief that oh, and uh, you know, there's a cur in curses? No, or? no. So actually, so when I spoke um, with Deborah Salfield, who is the woman who handed over twenty eight thousand dollars, so we had this conversation, and she said, you know, I don't believe in psychics. I was just, it was the worst day of my life. You know, in the in twenty four hours, she lost two jobs and her boyfriend, um, and she was basically at her emotional lowest point that she had been in, you know, in who knows how long. That happens and to me every other week, so <laughs> I feel like I'm prime for this. But, and but so she ahead. just decided to go in on a lark, but she really loved Sylvia. Sylvia was nice. She was empathetic. She listened. She looked really intelligent. She didn't look like she was going to swindle you. And she really made sense. You know, she was, she basically hit a lot of the right notes. She told, you know, Deborah that she was a really kind of smart woman that yes, bad things happen, but there's there's a reason for this and we can help you through it. I mean, in some ways it's a lot of, you know, a lot of non-psychic kind of but new agey type of movements think of, they actually operate on a lot of the same principles. You know, let's let's work through this, we can work through your problems. And that's not necessarily bad. It's almost like a therapist. Right. Right. Someone who actually listens to you, who lets you talk, and who is able to reflect kind of the world that you want back to you. And so Deborah in the moment, you know, we were talking earlier about storytelling and emotions. When you're in that situation and you're emotional, you don't necessarily think the way you would, you know, two hours in the, into the future when you've cooled off a little bit. And, and you, you point out that often it's situation right then and not personality yes. that, that drives the victim. But if someone's walking into a psychic's office, say, or place, 
uh, they're probably more likely to be in a bad situation Absolutely. than other. Like happy people aren't going to a psychic. Okay. Sad people are going to a psychic. Like help me. Is this situation I'm in going to get solved in the future? Absolutely. It's one of those things where, well, it can't hurt, can it? You know, let me try everything. So, right. And it can hurt. They just don't realize it. Um, and so um, I don't know if you've read the story. It wasn't in my book because it only happened um, a few months ago of the Wall Street banker who got swindled by two psychics. Oh, I, um, I didn't read and that. And he ended up dating one of them. You're um, kidding. Who that, yep, who then swindled him even further. Um, and once again, you think, how? How? And yet, when you're in that situation, I've become really sympathetic um, to the victims because you it's slow. It's not like right away you say, give me $200,000. That's not how it works. It's a slow building of a relationship, slow building of trust um, of someone you know who you start feeling is a confidant, someone who you can go to, someone who understands you, someone who has some sort of deeper insight. And you have no idea how many times I've met people who said, I do not believe in psychics. I agree with you. Psych there aren't any psychics, except my psychic is the exception. Wow. My psychic is the exception to the rule. And if everyone's psychic were the exception, then obviously everyone. And you, would be. you point out like Houdini was always trying, like the famous magician Houdini mm -hmm. was always trying to expose psychics and mystics and so on. And he never once found a real yeah. psychic. And Jay, you know the amazing Randy, Jane yeah. Randy, in current times is similar. Never, you know, never was able to find a real mm -hmm. psychic. Like, do you believe that there's anything like this? In, no, no, I don't. I mean, so in every case, it's basically a swindle. I think so. Unless I am open minded. If someone were to claim James Randi's prize, I would say I'm wrong. You know, now, now <laughs> is uh, do you think any psychics believe they're psychics? Yeah, I think some of them probably start believing at some point. Not all of them. Some of them are just ruthless. But I think that some of them probably end up saying, "Oh, you know, there's something there." Think of it. Think of it as um, you know, if you are a trader, right? Mm -hmm. You remember your good trades in the stock market, and you sometimes forget the bad ones. You said, "Oh, I knew, I knew that was coming." If you're a card player, say, "I knew that ace was coming. I could sense it," because you forget all the times that you sensed the ace and it wasn't an ace. So there's this confirmation thing. So I think that some psychics end up thinking that they really do have deeper insight than many, and maybe some believe in the, that they see the future. Well, I guess also. I was thinking about this a long time ago. Uh, one time, a friend of mine who's a huge Wall Street uh, banker, runs his own uh, private equity firm, and he told me he owes his entire career to this one psychic. So he told me, go, go see her. So I go out to like, you know, West New York or East New York, whatever New York that is, out in New Jersey, and go see her, and she tells me all this stuff. But what, what I what I really was struck though, but was by how you know this guy's a Harvard educated, like Harvard MBA, uh, you know, rose up huge in in Wall Street, and yet he's still willing to you know believe in in all yeah. this psychic stuff. And I was thinking to myself, there's this big confirmation bias, like. She only the psychic only hears from her successes. Right. If there's a failure, they kind of drop off, and right. so he never she never hears from them yeah. again. And he is only respond like if she if she happens to be the random person who told him a couple of things correctly, right. then of course what else is he gonna think? Oh, she knew the future. Yeah. So even if he went to like ten psychics, this is the one you know one of them will accidentally hit on some right things. Absolutely, and I wish I remember who said this. Some Wall Street guru um, at some point said, you know, here's the key to making successful predictions: you always make two of them in opposite directions, and one of them will always be right. Yeah. And people will only remember the ones you got right, and so you'll be hailed as an oracle. Well, well, there's a classic. <laughs> uh, there's a classic Wall Street scam where. Um, you send out predictions to a thousand people. Five hundred mm -hmm. have one prediction. Five hundred have the other. Yep. Now, for five hundred of them, it's going to be correct, like you said. Yep. Then you send out two predictions again yep. um, to two fifty and two fifty opposite yep. predictions, and then you know. Uh, 250 are still going to think you're two in a row and you keep on doing that until you have like let's say 10 people left and you've just made six correct decisions in a row and now you sell some huge thing to them um, because they think you're like an oracle of, yeah. of Wall Street. Yeah. So that's like a classic Wall Street scam that I've never actually seen it happen that's but it's pretty great. Yeah, <laughs> we should try it. We'll go to the business Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so, so what we're with with Sylvia Mitchell also, you talk about the cold read, how some of these psychics are able to look at somebody and be really good or talented. There is some skill they develop at reading people. Yes. What are some of, and I'm just saying this selfishly now, how can I better read people? You know, again, not as a con person, but just in general, what is this skill? 
Well, I mean, the, it's lots of skills. Um, one of them is just being incredibly observant. So this goes back to Sherlock Holmes, you know, actually looking at um, all of the cues that people give off right away. So if I walk in, you know, right away, you know, I'm wearing certain things. I carry myself a certain way. I smile a certain way. And it, over time, you start learning that, you know, I'm oh, she looks a little bit depressed. She looks like she didn't get enough sleep last night. You know, maybe something's on her mind. She looks really happy. Things are going well. And then you start doing, you know, you don't get to the Holmes level of, you know, you are going through a divorce and you have an alcoholic brother by looking at your watch. Um, but but it it is something where um, you can get a lot of cues from people's appearance because we normally don't look at other people the way we look at ourselves. So when you look at yourself in the mirror, you see all the all the detail, you know, the minute detail of your face. When you look at someone else, you don't actually pay that close attention. You kind of get an impression and that's it. But if you realize that that's the way that it works, you can right away flip it. You can say, okay, people aren't going to notice, you know, that I look really tired. They're going to get that just impression of me. But let me look at them the way I'd look at myself in the mirror and try to read all of those cues. You know, what so kind how of do you, how do you do that? Like, you mentioned that in the book, and I didn't quite understand. Like, how does somebody, how does somebody look at another person? the way that person would look at themselves in the mirror. It's just, it's honestly, it's just a switch of perspective. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, rather than just kind of glance at you and be done with it, I really look at you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I really examine kind of all of the details. You know, did you polish your glasses? You know, did... Clearly you know, not, by the way. <laughs> it's all foggy and dirty. So, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you actually start, you actually start building a picture, but we're not silent. People talk. And the moment you start talking, you start throwing off so many clues that can be used in a cold read. Like what? Uh, um, the question you ask. So one of the first things that psychics ask you is, is there a particular question that you want to focus on today? Seems like a very innocuous question, right? So let's say I say but, career. Right. So that's what I said when I went for my fake psychic reading. Um, well, it was a real reading, but but for me it was fake. Um, so I. So said, you say. So so I say. So I say. Although it was a very perceptive psychic. <laughs> um, so you say career right away. Okay, I know a lot of things about you. I know that you are either you know you are interested in career or career is important. It's somehow on your mind. I'm not a psychic, so I don't have as many data points as psychics. Or I can say you know really you're not interested in career because nobody would come to me with a career question, you're probably interested in something else, but you're too embarrassed. You don't want to say love, so you're going to say career. And how, and so, how, would, that, how would I then make the connection to love or, or... Well, then I start talking and I say, okay, you know, let's, you know, let's do a tarot reading. You know, let's start looking at these cards and I start looking at how you react to things. So um, if we, you know, if you think about like how good gamblers can sometimes read their opponents, um, you look at how they're reacting to different things that you're doing. You know, do you, are you nodding? Do you kind of look skeptical? You know, are you leaning in? Are you leaning out? Did you cross your legs? Like, is that, because that's a, are you in a kind of closed off posture? Are you in a more open posture? Do you seem intrigued? Am I on the right track? So we do this all the time, unless you're really watching it. And even then you might still be kind of throwing off some of these signals. I know right away if what I'm saying is actually making a connection, and if it's not, I switch tacks in such a way that you don't even realize how I've do, done it. How do like um, so like a, a friend of mine was telling me a story a few years ago. She went to a psychic, and she had to drive like three hundred miles to a couple across a couple states, and the psychic supposedly didn't know her beforehand, but then accurately said something about a deceased relative that no quote unquote nobody would have known, which is a common thing I hear. Right. How do they? Do stuff like that. And, and by the way, I'm not arguing for psychics. Right, right. I don't believe in, in psychics at all, particularly ones that are for sale. Um, I mean, I say particularly, but I've never seen any right. evidence of any kind of psychic. But I'm always just curious. Like, I, it seems like a magic trick, but I can't figure out how they do it. It's a, it's really hard. If I could do it, you know, I'd make a lot of money. <laughs> um, but they, I mean, so first of all, the nobody, could, no one could have known it. Oftentimes, they do have a confidant, and I wrote about a few people in the book um, where you had psychics who knew about the very intimate specific details and it ends up that the person who had recommended the psychic to this family um, had fed a lot of information and i i, I was curious psychic. about that too did so, they feed because the psychic was paying them or just they kind of just got into the psychics 
you know, magnetism and, and gave up this info? I actually don't know. That's a really good question. Um, and I'm guessing that they were being paid because this psychic um, had a lot of kind of cronies who, who did that sort of legwork for him because um, he was a holy man. Um, but But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe it was kind of that magnetism. But so oftentimes you have something like that. These days, if you book the appointment under any under your real name, um, it's very easy to find a lot of things about you before the appointment. And if you're a good psychic, you're going to do that. You're going to not just use Google, but use public records. It's worth it for you to, you know, pay $40 to get all of the records on somebody. And um, I wonder if also there are just like common things that are yes. true for like 95% of people. There absolutely So, so for instance, I was once reading about this sort of thing. And um, if you say to a woman, uh, oh, at some point in your childhood, your hair was cut really short yeah. and you were totally embarrassed about it. That's going to bring up some memories. That happened like, to me. Yeah, see, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so there's like a bunch of things you can say that kind of establish yes. this weird trust right away. Absolutely. So there are things that are common to all people. There are things that you can sort of guess. Um, you know, if you're coming to a psychic, chances are something has happened. You can say, oh, somebody, you know, close to you is either sick or maybe just passed away. And so you say, yeah, actually. And then right away you give them some information and you it's a very skillful setup because you give them two different outs you say sick or mm. um and right away you say oh yeah i saw some sort of some sort of change and i saw some illness um and so then they've given you the information but you take credit for it um and it's very funny i remember when i was reading about um conan doyle um, and one of the same author of all the Sherlock yes, Holmes stories. Yes, author of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, so after his death, um, there were lots of seances to try to bring Arthur Conan Doyle back because um, he believed in this. This was part of the reason he fell out with Houdini. They used to be close friends. And then yeah, so he was someone who was not only incredibly observant, was able to write about somebody incredibly observant, but towards the end of his life, because he had so much loss in his life, yeah, as up. you point out, he 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 kind of fell into these um, you know mediums and parapsychologists yeah. and so on that uh, yeah. took advantage. Um, and so there's there's this one scene where you see this psychic um, who is saying, "Oh, I feel the presence of um, someone," and the first name starts with an A. And then the person in the audience who wants Conan Doyle to come back actually starts thinking that they're talking to him because he identifies his part of the balcony and he really did have someone die um, with a name and it was everything matched up and it ended and then the person sitting two people away from him stands up and says oh my god that's me so so that's kind of going back to what you're saying that especially if you have a lot of people you're going to have pretty good hit rates especially if you go mm. slowly because you start gauging people's reaction you know does the letter r mean anything to you no well maybe you know actually it's not an r wait it's um, it's a B. I didn't quite see the bottom of it. Yes, the letter B means something to you. So you so you start you start doing that, and we are just. I don't think. I mean, I'm certainly not aware of how many cues I throw off, um, but we just we don't realize how much people can tell about us. Um, we think that we've been so great. You know, we think we have a poker face, when really we usually don't. Um, well, it's so funny because you you. Um you bring up, actually, in the book, a favorite example of mine, which you apply to several things. And, and the example is the, the the myth of our own superiority and various things. So <laughs> so I always say, you, you know, nine out of ten people think they're above average drivers. Yep. And I'm actually the one out of ten who knows he's a below average driver. Like, my license yep. has been suspended and I never got it back. And I just, <laughs> I refuse to get it back because I know I will kill someone eventually. But... Um, this is true for I noticed this in poker as well. Everybody thinks they're a great poker player. Like yep. they just have to sit down and they're gonna read everyone and they're gonna be yes. great. And I think in general, people think, and you pointed out again, well, we mentioned this earlier, but you pointed out that the smarter people tend to be more easily conned because they think they're so smart, they can't be conned. Yep. So the con artist is able to take advantage of that. And you have so many examples of it. But I guess there's this cognitive bias somehow that we, we have to think we're above average or else we'll just stay at home all the time that's, and not do anything. That's absolutely right. I mean, the only segment of the population that doesn't have this bias are the clinically depressed. Hmm. And that's, I mean, that's a big segment of the population. But that actually, I mean, that's, that's really depressing. That's really sad. It shows that if you see yourself honestly, 
it's a depressing <laughs> spectacle. You know, it's really not good to really see an unvarnished version of yourself. It, it's depressing or it's not in the sense that another area where this occurs where you see yourself for all your faults is when you truly love something and then you decide, okay, I'm going to try to get better at it. Right. Because by then you've developed taste, yep. but not skill. Yes. So let's say you want to be a great painter because you love all this, mm -hmm. all these famous painters and you finally get a set of paints and you start painting. You realize because you've loved all these painters, oh my gosh, I'm horrible. Like yes. I'm just not as good at them. So, so you either at that point get depressed or you start working really hard and it Absolutely. becomes a passion, a, a passion pursuit for you. Absolutely. No, I think that that's a very good point that in isolated circumstances like that, it could actually be very helpful. So I actually, I've wanted to be a writer my whole life, you know, from what I announced when I was five years old to my parents that I was going to be a writer. And Somewhere in junior high, I said, I'm never going to write because I started reading, you know, Dostoevsky. I'm Russian. I grew up with, you know, the Russian literature and Bulgakov and all of these books. And I said, okay, I'm never going to be able to do this. I give up. I'll just be a reader. And so for for a number of years, I just read a lot. Um, and then it just, it came back. I couldn't, I couldn't resist it. And, and then when you first started and you were first uh, reading the things back to yourself, were you a little depressed, like it wasn't as good as Dustin? Oh, absolutely. I wanted to throw everything out. Um, I still, I mean, I want to throw everything that I've written out because, you know, you keep getting better. And it's sometimes you re you write something and you're really proud of it. And you're like, this is good. And then a year later, you come back and you say, no, I'm so much better now. <laughs> um, and there are definitely things that I wish I had never published. It's, um, it's, it's, it's like, it's what, do you, what do you wish you never published? Um, well, I wish... Not the Sherlock Holmes book. <laughs> no, no, I'm glad I published it. But I wish I could have done more with it. You know, I feel like it didn't live up to its potential. And I feel like that about a lot of the things that I've written. There's some of the things like when I just started blogging, um, you know, back back in 05, um, I would have probably taken back some of those early blog posts, but they're alive and well, you can find them. Oh, well, I'm going to take a look for them. I did not look for those <laughs> in preparation for this. Let's stop to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Money has never made me happy, but it has made me feel secure. And that's really important, security and freedom, especially if you're an entrepreneur or freelancer and you're never sure when you're next gonna get paid. I have a question for all of you entrepreneurs running your own small businesses. If you started this minute, how much time would it take you to figure out which clients owe you what? If it sounds overwhelming to you, then you need to give FreshBooks a try. FreshBooks is dead simple, cloud accounting software made for entrepreneurs and small business owners who want to take the work out of managing their paperwork. Join over 5 million FreshBooks users who effortlessly create and send invoices in seconds. No formulas, no formatting, no fuss. Plus, FreshBooks has the best customer service. Your call will be answered within just a few rings, guaranteed. The best part about using FreshBooks is that you don't have to worry about your paycheck because FreshBooks is a reliable service that makes invoicing easy. Right now, FreshBooks is offering a free 30-day trial to my listeners. Just go to freshbooks.com slash James and enter James in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Look at technology. It's constantly accelerating. Every year, computers are getting faster and faster. Cars are starting to get automated. Solar panels are getting more efficient. Everything is changing. And when it does, it creates huge opportunity. Imagine if you could do something like help global climate change and make double-digit returns at the same time. Now you can. Introducing Wonder Capital, that's W-N-D-E-R, the Techstars-backed online investment platform that allows individuals to invest in solar projects across the United States. Your investment with Wonder goes directly to helping healthy U.S. businesses install solar panels. As those panels repay their loans to Wonder, you receive steady monthly cash flows in the form of interest payments. Since the beginning of the year, Wonder has originated over $25 million worth of solar projects. Wonder has two funds available, the Wonder Income Fund, which returns 6% a year during a 10-year period, and the Wonder Bridge Fund, which returns 11% a year during a two-year period. And best of all, Wonder doesn't take any fees for investing your money. Learn how you can begin earning up to 11% returns at wondercapital.com slash James. Wonder Capital, do well and do good. So a lot of the people who fell for the cons are falling for very simple cognitive biases. Yeah. And um, 
kind of this uh, sunken cost uh, bias is, was Huge a big one. one. Maybe, and it, it occurs across almost all of these cons, but maybe you can describe that a little bit yeah. in some of the ways con artists take advantage of that. Absolutely. So it's something that actually applies to all areas of life. When you've already invested something um, in a project, in a relationship, in any sort of endeavor, and it doesn't have to be financial, it can just be time, it can be effort, um, you don't see it as you know, you don't see it as something that's separate from your future decisions. You see your future decisions as totally linked to what you've already done. And so you think that, well, even if the right decision objectively is to kind of give up and to realize this isn't working, I'm not going to do that because I've already sunk so much into it. So it's called the sunk cost fallacy because of that. Once we've committed resources, we want to keep going. It's really hard for us to stop. And this happens in everything. I mean, you see it in bad relationships. You have relationship inertia where people said, but we've already, you know, I can't get out. You know, I've yeah, we've already we've spent been, two years together. Yeah, exactly. We've got to try to work on this. Exactly. We've been together for too Story long. Story of my life. Exactly. Well, no, I mean, so so I think it's very important to note that it's not just, you know, I've already, you know, invested thousands of dollars in this. It can, it can be an emotional investment. And, you know, it occurs very much in the investment industry, speaking of the word investment, yeah. because you might own let's say a stock and you know people a common advice is look at your stocks every day as if you don't own them and yeah. would you buy them today and but most of the time people can't do that they say oh i own it and i'm down 30 yeah. percent. i have to at least get my money back yes and they have that you know skewed bias and it's actually it's really hurtful it makes you make bad decisions because that's not the way that you should be deciding i mean you should be deciding based on the information today not based on the information however many years ago. And information gets constantly updated. So how, how do con artists um, take advantage of the fact that, that this cognitive bias exists to basically initiate uh, and, and do their cons? Well, so they make you invested in, in a situation. It can be in their friendship. You know, it can be they're, they're building a relationship. And so then it gets uncomfortable. You can't say no to them because you feel like you'd be letting them down. It might be financial. So there are some con artists I write about in the book who actually get you to kind of give them a little bit of money, but then you're already invested because you also, and it's not just the investment, it's also confirmation. Because if you helped someone out in the past, that means they're worth it. That means they're a good person. Mm -hmm. So you should keep helping them out. So this is, I think, what happened with Crichton and Damara. So because he'd given him money, because he'd helped him, that was already kind of something that he needed to keep doing in the future the, to it, prove to himself that he was that he'd made the right decision initially. I mean, it feels like there there's an opposite thing though. Whereas if someone gives you money too, you feel obligated to help them. So whether you give the money or whether you get the money, it seems like it, there's different biases that maybe work in both or in the same unless, way. Unless you're a con artist, in which case you don't care because right. you know exactly what you're doing. So you don't feel any obligation. So that's why um, there's, there's a quote from a con artist. Um, and I don't remember if I quoted him in the book or not, but it's basically the moment that you feel sympathy for your victim, you're dead in the water. Mm. That's, that's what you can't do. You can't, as a con artist, you can't feel any obligation. You have to make them feel obligation. But you know, I feel like, so this is why I think when I'm reading the book, I often, I felt like, oh my gosh, am I a victim or am I a con <laughs> artist? Because the, 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 all, a lot of these techniques that we're, we're calling them techniques but they're also used in very positive situations Absolutely. like you don't mention it in the book but there's a but this exact technique is used by uh benjamin franklin right so do you, i don't know if you know that story he's yeah. a young guy he has an enemy in the pennsylvania state assembly and this guy totally hated benjamin franklin so benjamin franklin did something very sim simple he asked the guy to borrow if benjamin franklin could borrow a book from him Benjamin Franklin borrowed the book and then returned it, and then the guy was friends with him ever after. Yeah. Because he figured in his mind, oh, I did this favor yep. for Benjamin Franklin, so I must like him. That's absolutely and right. So Benj did Benjamin Franklin, would you say he conned this guy? Because he did it bit. kind of on purpose to... A little bit. A by little friendship. Bit. A little bit. So that's, you know, so that's consistency, which is sort of a sunk cost, but a little bit different. So there are, t there are two different elements going on here. But yeah, I mean... In my so so the way that I differentiate because a lot of these techniques you do see in the legitimate world um, as well as the world of the con artist is intent um, and was your intention benign or malicious? I think in Franklin's case, I mean it does look a little bit cold blooded, but it's I think it's ultimately still probably benign. He wasn't trying to do it. He wasn't trying to take advantage of this guy. So so okay so that's interesting though. Uh, what separates let's say the con artist from Benjamin Franklin? 
being intent. So the con artist, you can argue in mo in let's say 90% of cases is trying to get money um, kind of, let's say, illegally or under fraudulent circumstances. In 10% of the cases, it's like Damara, the first one you, you spoke about, who just wanted to fulfill some ego trip without mm -hmm. worrying about the consequences. So there was some there was some fraud happening. It's hard to distinguish what's crime and what's not, but it's definitely fraudulent. And uh, uh, if what are what are what are po more positive ways in which people can use some of these techniques to basically help their lives, make their lives better? Well, I think that um, what we were talking about earlier in terms of listening um, is an incredibly important skill. So one of the commandments of the con artist, this con artist, Victor Lustig, Count Lustig. Who's considered um, like the, the yeah, father of con artists. He's, he's, um, he was a brilliant con artist in the 20th century, sold the Eiffel Tower twice, had this invention, the money box that printed out money, mm. um, and ended up selling it to the sheriff of the town when he was in jail for selling money boxes. Um, so this guy was very, very good. Call, conned Al Capone. Um, I read about that in the book, but he had the oh, yeah, commandments. He was the, he was the one who, um, he, it was genius actually. Describe that con actually, it was genius. <laughs> so he um, came to Al Capone and he said, Al, you know, I've got a business proposition for you. Um, if you lend me $10,000 or 20,000, I don't remember what the actual number was. Let's say $20,000, I'll double your money. Um, in a month. And Capone said, I know exactly who you are. I know you're a flim flammer. You know, your, repu your reputation precedes you, but you know who I am. I'm Al Capone, so you're not going to mess with me. So here you go. Let's, let's see what you can do. So Lustig takes the money. Um, he puts it in a safety deposit box and he goes back to New York, which is where he's based at the time. Month goes by, he comes back, takes the money out, goes back to Al Capone, gives him back the 20000 and says, Al, I'm so incredibly sorry. Um, I really needed the cash myself. I really thought I had a line on something, but it fell through. So here's your money back. I'm so sorry that I couldn't deliver. And Capone just sits there. He's flabbergasted. He said, I expected one of two outcomes. Either you would come back with nothing, you lost the money, or you would have doubled it because you would have had some sort of shady dealings. But by God, you're an honest man here to reward you for your honesty since you said you were going to that you were going through some financial difficulties take five thousand dollars um and from then on i you know you'll be my friend i know that i can trust you that you're honest and that's what lustig was after he wanted that five thousand dollars and it's just so it's brilliant it's so funny because that's a case where he needed to essentially purchase reputation from capone yeah. and tr then trade it for a little bit of money, and that's the way he did it. So that yeah. was kind of this deeper It's great. Con. And to some so, extent, Madoff operated under the same principle. It wasn't like he was doubling everybody's money no. every year. He had very just small but consistent returns. Yeah. So people who thought, oh my God, he must be a fraud, were probably fooled into thinking, uh, uh, he's, who knows? Like the returns yeah. were so small. It wasn't like fraudulent type returns, yeah. although it turned out to be. Right, right. No, Madoff was incredibly smart um, in the way he did it. But yeah, Lustig um, had the Ten Commandments of the con artist, going back to your question on what we can learn. And one of them was a con artist isn't a great talker. A con artist is a great listener. Mm. Um, and that's, I mean, it's a con artist commandment, but that's actually a really wonderful insight into human relationships. You know, how do you form a good relationship? You listen to other people. And so that, I think, is something that we can use, you know, in building friendships and um, forming new bonds and actually kind of really getting to know people, being truly curious about them. Con artists really are curious about their victims because that's the way that they can profile them and take advantage of them. But you don't have to have that type of intent. Your intent can really just be curiosity for curiosity's sake. Let, let me get to know you. I'm curious to know who you are. I'd like to, I'd like to make a new connection. Um, and so a lot of these things in the right hands can be really just powerful tools of human relationships. And so what's another commandment? Um, I don't know what the other commandments are off the top of my head. Because that one looks Sorry. pretty valuable. Now I need to know the other nine. Yes, yes. Now I, need I feel to... like now a podcast can... is like a con game because that's what a podcast can... is. We can look up the other nine commandments. Yes, I have them written down, but I don't remember them off the top of my head. You know, it seems with Madoff, too, there were a couple other things going for him. And you mentioned one of them, which is scarcity. Like he was always saying you kind of you couldn't just put money in no. his fund. You had to essentially beg him to take yeah. your money. So that was another way he's like, oh, you know, you can, you in a weird way build trust by creating scarcity. Absolutely. I mean, scarcity, exclusivity, mm -hmm. those are things that really appeal to people. 
um, you you know want to be a member of a club that will have you, right? <laughs> right? It's a it's a very it's a very basic kind of premise that if it's scarce, if it's exclusive, it must be good because I can't get in because it's a limited it's a limited good. And people, so there was um, one guy didn't a lot of cons didn't make it into the book. Um, I there's know. there's so many stories yeah. of cons in the book. By the way, it's like an encyclopedia <laughs> of con, con artistry. Let me send you the hundreds of pages that didn't make it in. You'll, right, you'll have them. lots of more. Um, but there was this guy who did a rare book fraud, um, and that's a very similar principle. You can get a lot of money if you say, you know, this is a one-of-a-kind, rare thing because the correct type of person, kind of the bibliophile, the person who loves books, will pay a lot of money for that rare kind of exclusive copy. Scarcity, you know, if you get make something seem scarce, then of course it ends up in this con that it's not actually this rare book. Um, but that feeling that you're getting a prize is really valuable. Some con artists do it. So one of the guys I write about, Matthew Brown, who pretended to be an aristocrat, um, he got all sorts of you know connections, money. American Express and Barclays gave him credit cards because they thought that he was from an aristocratic background. This guy was good. I mean, he edited Wikipedia. He put himself into lineages. I mean, he actually created a trail for himself online and never trust Wikipedia. <laughs> but pe people- Jimmy Wells has been on this podcast, by the way. <laughs> he might disagree, but go ahead. <laughs> well, you always double checked Wikipedia. Right. There are some amazing Wikipedia articles, but something like that, you don't catch that right away. It's not like there's an editor sitting there who says, hmm, is he really part of that lineage? Let's let's but, try to figure it out. But that's interesting because social proof is also uh, uh, something that's very important in marketing. Yeah. And I mean, that's why in, in any, you know, nine out of 10 dentists say X, you know, is a very strong marketing yeah. technique. And that's what he's basically doing. He's using other sources yeah. to validate his own existence and to, to make the con, but that's also used in marketing and sales. Absolutely. And con artists do this all the time. Damara called it papering. Mm -hmm. So he would paper his trail before he arrived anywhere. He'd write all the recommendations himself, but he'd have these wonderful inquiries and recommendation letters from all these luminaries sent to a university so that by the time he got there, you know, people are like, oh, you're the famous Damara or whatever his name was at the time. We've heard so much about you. All of these people talk about you because social validation really matters. But that can be used, you know, all of these things can be used for good. Um, one of the books that I mention um, in my book is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, which is considered kind of the con artist's Bible. Mm -hmm. And it's also a Bible to you know, a lot of businessmen and a lot of people who just want to be better at social interactions. So, I mean, if you if you actually parse what a con is without, let's take away like the taking advantage of someone of someone for your own ends and just look at the process. It's figuring out who someone is, gaining their trust, forming a relationship, and then having some sort of kind of, in the case of a con, it's for your benefit, but having some sort of mutual kind of connection there. Well, you think about a con short for confidence. Yeah. So you don't want to go into a, a situation. So all of these situations are relationships of some sort. Yeah. You don't want to go into a relationship without building confidence. Yeah. You want to build confidence with whoever you're interacting yes, with. Exactly. So it seems like that's it's a universe. These are universal themes, obviously. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just, it seems what separates the con artist from, let's say, a functioning human being with good relationships mm -hmm. is they have bad intent. Yeah. They They want to. I mean, taking advantage of others for your own ends. That's the crucial thing. So are you, and that's, I mean, people have asked me, especially because I have a chapter devoted to religion, you know, is all religion a con? And say, well, I can't, I'm not going to go so far as to say that. Um, but I will say that the reason that religion emerges spontaneously in every society is the same reason we have con artists, because it's this it's a very similar dynamic, this kind of need for belief for relationships. And what separates the con artist from a genuine religious leader is, you know, am I doing this for me to try to dupe people? Am I, you know, a cult leader or am I kind of a leader that um, is using religion for, for some other ends? Or do I, you know, is this really something that I want to do because I think it's going to make people's lives better? Well, also, so take like a typical weekend all around the country, there's a, a thousand spiritual retreats happening everywhere. Yep. And tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people are going to them. So 
let's say you're going to a retreat. How do you write? What are kind of typical? And you discuss cults and religion and mm -hmm. so on with the the chapter on David Sullivan. Um, what are some typical kind of cult recognition techniques I can use the next time I'm in some sort of retreat? Well, one of the things that Sullivan or Sully, as he was known, um, really stressed is that the modern cult is really difficult to spot. So before, so he started doing this back in the 60s, he said it's so easy, you know, you can you can find the guru and try and see right away that it's a cult. These days, you know, it's a business retreat, you know, people are sending their employees there, everyone's wearing suits, it's all right. this like corporate thing and it's a cult. Um, and so one of the, I mean, one of the big signs is, are they trying to block access to the outside world? Like you how? Know? Um, so like are, leave your phones at the, leave at the door. Yeah, yeah, leave everything and you can't communicate. And if you communicate, you're somehow betraying the trust and the confidence of people here. And you so, can make this argument that the problem of modern society is, you know, too much constant multitasking and connection to the internet with all this BS information mm -hmm. on it. So we're just going to clean ourselves exactly. of outside influence. Well, and it's so, it's great that you said that because um, one of the techniques that they often use is they'll lure you in through like a yoga retreat or like something that actually seems really legitimate. I mean, I'd go to a yoga retreat. That's great. You know, I want to disconnect for a weekend and be in nature. And then you talk about, you know, what we were talking about earlier with forging connections and kind of feeling some sort of bond of reciprocity. Then you know these people, they're nice. You had such a nice weekend. And then they take it to the next level. Well, now we're really going to cleanse you. You know, that was just a weekend. And now all of a sudden, you know, you can't leave or you can leave. They never say, oh, you can't leave but you kind of can't. And then they start kind of indoctrinating you. And I, I don't mean indoctrinating in the sense of these, this is what we believe in. They start using different language and you start speaking like them. And then- Like I'll, what, what's an example? Um, I would say, so, so you, you call someone, um, like what do you call the members of this society? You know, are you, um, I, I, I actually don't know what what a cult would would call you, but maybe maybe you are our spiritual. I'm your spiritual guide, and you are kind of the spiritual devotee. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you're talking about guides and devotees. But basically, they start suddenly shifting your frame of reference so that you're no longer communicating in the same language as people outside. And slowly, they start stripping you of your connections to the outside world. This happens over time. And a lot of times at first people leave, they come in and out. It's not like they're forced to stay there, but eventually they don't anymore. Um, and sometimes, you know, you have cults where, um, where it's not like you're in one specific place. They operate all over the country. There's one very big one that I will not name because otherwise it will derail our whole conversation. Um, but there you have people who seem to be leading normal lives, but you have very strict directives, what you can do, what you can say, who you can and can't communicate with, you know, how you live your life. Um, and you don't even realize that it's intrusive because at that point you really truly believe it. So what Sullivan did is he would actually infiltrate the cult. He'd become a member because he realized that the only way to get people out was to speak with them in their language. You can't tell them you're in a cult. You need to get out. They won't listen to you. Um, that's why most attempts are not successful. How would he get at, people at, out? Because I, I saw in the book he would like you know, get people out, but you didn't quite say how, like what he would say to them to get them out. He never, he never said. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, um, not just because it's a trade secret, but because he just wanted to protect kind of those relationships. So he, he never said what he did exactly, but it was, I think it was predicated on, um, kind of appealing to them on the level that they know. We're so thinking on in, in the book you mentioned actually a good friend of mine apollo robbins um it. and you describe a trick he did and it sounded fascinating can you describe the trick that he did <laughs> on you so we were having dinner at, during which i kept checking to make sure that all of my uh, belongings right, were cause, still cause on he's me. a master pickpocket yes, like yes. a guy can take anything <laughs> off of anything yes yeah, so so we were having dinner where every three seconds i would go like this 
right. and actually just make sure everything was still intact. But he was trying to demonstrate, he was helping me understand how some of these techniques work. And so he took just three random items from the dinner table. You know, it was a salt shaker, remember a piece of lemon, um, and I don't remember what the, an olive. Um, and he said, I'm going to read your mind. I'm going to tell you which of these objects you're going to pick. Um, and so what he would, he'd place a barrier between the objects and him, so, and then I would pick one of the objects, and he would figure out exactly what I took and in what hand it was. Um, and this just kept, and he kept doing it over and over and over. Then he explained, I promised I wouldn't tell him how he did it. Um, I wouldn't tell the, the world how he did it, but he explained it to me. And he said, so, so, so I've actually been... Saying, he, you picked an object, he said, he would here say, are three he, objects, put one in your hand, and then I'm going to guess which one you exactly. picked. And he was always right. And he was always right. And then he explained to me how he was very subtly changing how he talked to me and how he was directing me basically so that he knew um, by my answers because we were having a conversation uh, it's not like it was silent um, all the time there was chatter going on which if you think about magic tricks there's always back and forth there's always chatter there's always a story that's the great magician the great magician and apollo has both he's both just a phenomenal sleight of hand artist and a phenomenal storyteller but great magicians don't actually need to be as dexterous as he is they can be brilliant just by holding people's attention they think one of the reasons apollo actually is as good as he is um, at being able to take anything is that he can hold your attention um, that he's Everything is so home. So basically, we would be having a conversation, and he he would know what I took because he told me what to took what what I took, and it took him multiple times of explaining this. And then he said, "Now try it on me." It was very difficult. He made it seem so effortless. Is he, it like a statistical thing that basically over thousands of times with people, no. he knows what words trigger what objects? Well, maybe maybe for him that is, but um, he it was basically in the specific directions that he gave me of how to how to choose objects. Um, fascinating. It is. You can if you, you, I'm sure he would he would be delighted to tell you and to show you. I'm going to ask. <laughs> um, um, but he, but it's it's so funny. There's there's definitely a very close affinity between that kind of magic and cons. So so what's interesting to me too is your first book, How to Think Like, you know, Mastermind, How to Think Like uh, Sherlock Holmes and the art of avoiding the con are very similar. Because if you think about it, yeah. let's take a typical Sherlock Holmes case. The the criminal is in plain sight. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of Sherlock Holmes trying to figure out who that is. It's not a typical crime case where the criminal might completely disappear. Mm -hmm. So the criminal is in, in plain sight and pretending not to be a criminal, similar to a con artist. And it's through observation that he has to figure out how to be un conned in some sense yeah. uh, and figure out who the criminal is. And that's what someone who's avoiding a con has to do also. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's related to you kind of boil it down in this almost Zen way to mindfulness and, mm -hmm. and what you also call observation with a capital O. But maybe describe some of the Sherlock Holmes techniques of observation and how we realistically can do them. Well, I think the number one thing is trying to take a step back from your emotion um, because we are I mean, our world is clouded by our emotions, how we're feeling, you know, how someone makes us feel, how a situation makes us feel, how we're just generally feeling that day. Um, and both criminals um, of the Holmes variety and con artists, and sometimes it's sometimes it's one and the same. Um, they play on that. They actually excite your emotions. They create. They are very good at eliciting certain feelings, which then cloud your judgment. It goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning: storytelling and why stories are so effective because stories elicit emotions. The second you're emotional, you're no longer logical. You're no longer reasonable. And so Sherlock Holmes is very good. People say that he doesn't experience emotion. That's not true. He, what he does is he acknowledges it and says, "Okay, I'm not going to let it. I'm going to discount." it. So yes, this is a beautiful woman, dear Watson, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. We don't know <laughs> anything about her. So let's just put that to the side and let's acknowledge that she's making you feel like she's, you know, the greatest gift to mankind ever. And we know that in a few stories you'll marry her, but that's okay. Um, let's just put that aside and focus on what she's saying. Let's focus on these sorts of things. Like we were talking with the psychics and the cold reads. What are the cues that she's actually projecting? Um, and let's let's try to go there. Um, and the other thing that he does, which I think is very relevant to the modern world and would actually probably help you avoid getting conned, um, is to just be 
present to not be multitasking. You know, Sherlock Holmes would not have an iPhone that he was constantly checking um, everywhere that he went. It's kind of that that initial interaction with Watson um, where he knows everything about Watson. If he had been looking down at his phone and, you know, just in his own world, that never would have happened. And we do it all the time. And I think that um, it's something that people have done all the time. I, I hate people who blame technology for it, and I'm not one of them. Um, it's a very natural human tendency to try to multitask. And, you know, we we don't like paying attention. It's hard because you have to focus and you actually have to immerse yourself. Um, and this has been a problem since, you know, medieval times, at least. You have monks writing about how they can't pray. <laughs> they call it the noonday demon. Um, and um, so it's not necessarily technology, but technology has made it much worse because now we have all of these outlets all the time for multitasking. And multitasking is the opposite of mindfulness and it's the opposite of being observant enough so that you actually notice what's happening and you avoid being conned, um, avoid being taken advantage of. So how can you practice that? How can you get better at mindfulness? Well, one of the exercises that I always do myself, um, I mean, first I, I do meditate um, for not for very long, but like 10 minutes a day. And I think that that's incredibly useful. And there are lots of different styles of meditation. Um, different things work for different people. But um, I recommend actually doing one very simple, although it can be very challenging, experiment, which is go for a walk along the river or in a park somewhere in nature without your phone without anything for an hour for an hour for an hour that's a big ask that's a big ask um do it for 20 minutes if you don't have an hour but just leave everything an hour is a big ask but i think you need the hour to actually start feeling what what that does to you mm. um because all of a sudden you know you 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 have this moment of panic you know i know that when i forget my phone at home i feel i feel very panicked and i forget that i lived more than half my life with no smartphone <laughs> um, and no cell phone, um, come to think of it. So I forget that this w was very normal. Now I feel like, oh my God, I'm, I'm lost. Something terrible is going to happen. So it takes a while to get over that. And then you start noticing, because mindfulness isn't just noticing things about the environment, it's noticing things about yourself. It's being able to pay attention to your thoughts, what's going on inside your head, how you're feeling, to actually read your own body and your own emotions. Because the only way that you can then account for them and then you can um, make kind of accurate judgments is if you are able to understand yourself and so many of us aren't i mean we don't pay attention to ourselves either in, know, in what way like you know you don't actually listen to the chatter in your head um, you don't actually pay attention to what your body is telling you quite often or what your mind is like, telling what, what you. might my body tell me in a bad situation like how um, will my body talk to me well, your body might tell you that you're actually feeling physically uncomfortable and you're discounting it. Um, and it might tell you, you know, let me just give you like a very silly example. Um, if you exercise um, and your body tells you, oh, you did something really wrong there. Let's stop. You often don't even notice. You just keep. And then in retrospect, you're like, oh, when that happened, I probably should have stopped. It's funny. I guess one time I had a boss, this is many years ago, and I kept we kept going out to dinner and I kept feeling really bad at my, about myself by the time I got home. Yeah. Eventually I realized I have to quit this job. Yeah. I'm like just feeling bad about myself all the time. So stuff like that exactly. is important to pay attention to. Absolutely. How does Absolutely. this work in like, this is going to be kind of a naive question, but how does this work in dating? So obviously when you're on a date with somebody, yeah. both sides are presenting their best version of themselves. In some sense, I don't want to call it a con because, but you're, but you I mean, are trying to build confidence yeah, in the other person absolutely. in what you're doing. No, I mean dating has a lot, a lot of parallels with cons. So how can you be as sincere as possible and also kind of recognize the danger signals? Well, I, I know this is not totally not the topic of your book, but no, I want to know. No, no, it's actually really important. Um, I think you need to, and this is really hard to say when you're actually in the situation, you have to be very aware of possible red flags because you not only are presenting your best self, if you like the person, you really, you want to see the best in them too. At first, you know, you have that kind of, and a lot of times, some of the things that will become problems, it's very difficult to be totally different from the person you normally are over any extended period of time. One date, maybe. Two dates, uh, three dates, you'll probably start slipping up a little bit. And so you actually 
have to pay attention to some of these things. So I can give you an example of a woman I write about in the book who ended up moving in with a con artist who was an imposter and almost marrying him, which is, I, it's really scary to think that you, that, that right. might happen. And there were red flags, but she was so in love with him that she actually just dismissed them all out of hand. I remember so, the story, like what were the other red flags sort of appeared later? What were the red flags in the well, beginning? Red flag number one, she never met any of his friends mm. or anyone who knew him for more than a year. Mm. Uh, everyone loved him, but they were all new, new acquaintances. There was no one old in his life. Mm. So no relationship over six months, big red flag. But she just thought, oh, you know, he's adventurous. He likes new things. You know, he, he changed gears who knows so she was like you know. watson in that sense that she got overwhelmed by kind of some exactly. good qualities exactly and didn't really think about everything so, but, that that's a, but that's a red flag i mean you want someone who has some sort of a history mm. um and there are lots of i mean there are lots of things that it depends on you and kind of what's a red flag for you if you're actually that was a con but if you're actually just talking about a relationship is this person going to be right for me that can be incredibly difficult i mean i i would be a millionaire if i could sit here and tell you you know these are the things you need to look out for your next book my, my next book how to date <laughs> mindfully right or the con of dating the con of dating um excellent you can you can co-author yes we can, all right we can do i'll be the I, I failed at all of it so i could i'm the victim but it's really, it's it's actually, it's a really tough question. So I, I went out with um, a practitioner of the game <laughs> while I was, while I was um, doing this to try to see how a pickup artist works, because pickup artists, when you're actually being a pickup artist, that's a con. I mean, you're trying to take advantage of people right. for your own ends. And oh my God, this guy was so smooth. And then uh, it was just, I was just a fly on the wall. He just let me, as long as he remained anonymous in the book, he was happy to let me watch him operate. And there was this one poor girl um, who was, she was just completely smitten and I felt really bad. So when he went to the bathroom at some point, I came up to her and I was like, just so you know, you know, I'm a journalist. I'm writing about this guy. He's a pickup artist. Like you. Like what did he do? And she, well, hold on. What did she do? She she just laughed at me and gave him her number anyway. Uh, and I mean, I funny. I was completely I was useless. I tried to do something good and it and it didn't work. So look at me just, selfishly asking, what did he do? Like <laughs> I don't give I don't give a heck about her. Like I wanted to well, know what he, he was, did. You know, he was really nice. He didn't even do any negging. Mm -hmm. You know, you have negging the the kind of the big technique where you make someone feel bad about themselves, so that then they feel like you're actually. You know, you're there to make them feel better, even though they're the ones who made you feel bad in the first place. He didn't do that. He was just very charming and made it, you know, made it seem like she was the one who wanted him and not the other way around. Like, oh, I see that you're looking at me. You know, I see. I'll, I'll be nice. I'll accommodate. Oh, you seem nice. Okay, I can make this work. Like, it's always... Yeah. It's flipping it around, even though he's the one who targeted her. And then suddenly she doesn't know what she, what to think. She says, oh, yeah, I have been interested in him. I was looking at him. I'm so glad that he reciprocates. It's such a, it's a funny way to, to watch something unfold. And from the sidelines, and I was all obviously unwittingly wouldn't, being a wouldn't, woman. Wouldn't the reaction be, though, like, what are you talking about? I wasn't looking at you. Well, it depends. You can't just say, I saw you looking at me. It's the way that you kind of, that you present it. You don't say, I saw you looking at me. You say, oh, hey, you know, I've, you know, how are you? You, you basically approach and make it clear that you're approaching because there was interest there. I'm not a pickup artist. I can't, I can't reciprocate. I can't replicate the relationship. And so much of it actually isn't in words, it's what I was saying earlier, the nonverbal signals that can be very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so much of it is communicated that way, especially when you talk about relationships and attraction and something like that. And it's really, I mean, so much of that is based on very primitive s signals that mm -hmm. are kind of on a much deeper level than any sort of cognitive factors that it becomes really difficult to to say, okay, well, what are you supposed to look out for? Um, and I think, my, I mean, my answer is ultimately you you don't know and you kind of have to put yourself out there and see what happens and well, sometimes I, it'll work out. I think, I think the mindfulness thing is very important on yeah. the victim side. And I think attempting to be sincere 
as opposed to like gaming it. Yeah. I think just for the sake of both sides, because you're not going to end in, up in a good relationship if you had to persuade someone to Absolutely. be in a relationship with you. Absolutely. And it was only, you know, I, it took me a long time to figure that out. That, you know, it's really exhausting. That'll be the subject of a whole other podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's really exhausting not being yourself. Yeah. And... <laughs> interesting. Well, Maria Konnikova, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. The Confidence Game, I really uh, think people should read it. Like, it was inspiring to me. I want to I wanna protect myself, and I also want to make sure I'm never conned and never am a con man, because I think it's both sides I got scared of. And then uh, Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes, people should read that. I'm going to actually do a second pass on that myself, So because I didn't really fully read it. But uh, thanks again for coming on the show, and your next book, you have to come back. I would love to. Thanks for having me. This is one of the best interviews I've ever done. Excellent. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you really want to get more added value to this podcast, this is very important to know. The average successful multimillionaire has on average seven to 10 different sources of income. So the first thing you might ask, how can they do this if they have a job? And the answer is they don't have a job. Here's what a job is. You wake up, you drive to your job, you commute, you go to the job, you commute back and you're in the job all day. That's only one source of income. The only way you can get rich at a job is if you rise up to be CEO. And even then it's very difficult. Not that many CEOs are getting the kind of salary that will add up to the equivalent of seven different sources of income in a job. You're only going to have again, one source of income. I also want to say being an entrepreneur is not necessarily the way to get seven sources of income, quote unquote, entrepreneur. There's all this entrepreneur porn on the internet. All that really means is you're going to just create your own job. It's still a job. You're going to create a company and then you're going to be, let's say the CEO of that company. Well, now you have one job again, only you have a lot more stress. I'm not saying don't be an entrepreneur, but at least take this into account. Sure. You have potential for massive wealth. If you start to build up the company and it's successful, maybe you sell it, maybe you have an IPO, whatever, but it's still only one job and 85% of businesses fail. Entrepreneurship is certainly a source of massive wealth, but it's also very risky, very scary. And I could tell you, at least on my own behalf, it's very stressful. I like to mitigate risk. And the way you mitigate risk is by making sure you have multiple and diverse sources of income. So how can you start? I'm going to give you an example, and it's an example that you can start while you're at a full-time job. Just go to jamesaltucher.com slash seven to find out how you can add a new stream of revenue to start supplementing your income right now. This opportunity is